Hey, we're here with the Dudley Rutherford Podcast, and I have a guest of all guests with me today. His name is Jay John, an evangelist from the... Across the pond. Across the pond. In England. The UK. Yes. Uh, people from America who've never been there. How do you describe the UK, the, across the pond? Ah, oh, well. What is the UK? What is what is that all about? Well, the United there? Kingdom, it, it sounds grander than it really is. And geographically, it's very, very small. And I understand that I think you could put the whole of the UK uh, in your in the Texas state. Really? So we're very small. Really? <laughs> yes. You're like the most normal person in all of the UK, correct? Would you not agree with that? Well, I, I, I think... Um, uh, the answer is no. what the word normal means. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're excited to have a few moments to share with you. And I know you're, you're a long ways from home. And we're here in the great state of California. We have a podcast here that we kind of film out of uh, Shepherd Church, where I pastor in Porter Ranch, California. And this uh, podcast is all about shining like the stars in the universe in the book of Philippians. Uh, the writer tells us that we are to do everything without complaining or arguing, which is, seems, seems like that's all we ever do over here in, in the United States. But it says, so that you may be blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you will shine like the stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. And to me, that means that we live in a crazy world, a crazy society, and that as believers, as we hold out the word, as we live as God would have us to live, that against that dark backdrop, that believers, we shine like the stars. And you look up at those stars, you can't help but think there must be a God that holds this world in the palm of his hand. And we wanna to talk to people on this podcast and deal with topics where people, when you look at their life, you can see that God is working through them in a mighty, mighty way. And when I look at Jay, John, a very unique, unique individual. We see God working and doing some amazing things through your life. And uh, here in America, the evangelist that we all think of is Billy Graham, who recently been, went to be with the Lord. And I've heard you called as a cross between Mr. Bean and Billy Graham. One reason, you, lo you do look a little like Mr. Bean. Do you, not, do you, do you refute that? I do. You do. 100%. There's, no, there's nothing about no. you that looks like Mr. B. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know where liars go, don't no. you? No. <laughs> well, for us, we're all enam. We like Mr. Bean. He's yes. a funny guy. And you yes. are a funny guy. And yet you're an evangelist. I want to ask first about the humor. Where did the humor come from in your life? You, you are a very funny person. Your, your mind just thinks funny. Well, Dudley, I, I just see things... Uh, in a humorous sort of way. I, it's not, I'm not a comedian. I'm not trying to be funny, but I think uh, the humor's there. And I think Jesus was very funny. I honestly, when he, when he said to the disciples, he says, uh, you know, uh, before you take the speck out of someone else's eye, take the telegraph pole out of your own eye. Right. You know, it's like, that's so funny. <laughs> uh, and a lot of Hebrew humor was humor by exaggeration. Right. And I think sometimes we don't always see it, but I think humor is, is good and it, it kind of lubricates, it kind of soothes. And a lot of, for example, if you've got a headache and you're gonna take um, um, a pill for your headache, uh, normally you can't take that ingredient by itself. Right. But because it's coated in sugar, you're able to mm, swallow mm, it, digest mm, it. And mm. I, I think humor helps us in communicating the message of Christianity and make it digestible for people. Okay, I, I agree with everything you just said there, but I do not think Jesus was as funny as you. I, I think you're funnier <laughs> than Jesus. But where did that funny bone come from in you? Do you, know, do you look at, has it been in your, your whole life when you yeah. were a little kid? Were you I, funny? Were your I, parents funny? I mean, where did this gotta come from somewhere? Well, I honestly think when I became a Christian, I, I probably got funnier. Really? Uh, yeah, I did actually. And, uh, I think I've always had a good sense of humor. Uh -huh. um, 
But I, I think the, key, the thing is this, that you've just got to be yourself. Right. Don't try and be like anyone else. And I've always tried to be myself. Well, it's, you're just a joy to be around. Thank and, you. and anyone who hangs out with you for a little bit gets, gets a, a dose of that medicine, that happy medicine. And, and uh, I want to talk primarily about the, uh, uh, about the evangelism side of you. Sure. And uh, I tell people you're an evangelist from the UK. Uh, do you consider yourself an evangelist? Oh, I'm an evangelist. And yes. explain to I've someone been... who doesn't know what that means, what does it mean to be an okay. evangelist? Over the years, um, because the word evangelist and the word evangelism um, kind of mean different things to different people, um, we've often tried to uh, shelve those words and try and use alternative words. Yes. And, uh, and the more I've thought about it, the more I don't want to use alternative words. I love the fact that I'm an evangelist, which is quoted in the Bible three times. Mm. Um, and the word evangelism. And, and basically, I'm a carrier of Christ's good news, and I convey and communicate that good news to others. That's basically what the word means. And, and have you been doing this your whole life? Did, was there a point where you got saved or you met the Lord? Uh, what is your story of, of, of uh, faith, your journey a little bit? Well, I, I was an agnostic, uh, and I was a student in London, I met a Christian, and over a period of a year, um, he helped me come to an understanding really? of who Jesus was. Really, And then uh, the, the day after, I started telling people about Jesus. Not because anyone told me, uh, but it just mm. seemed natural mm. to do this, mm. that I've just discovered it's this like, amazing... It's like if you had the cure for cancer, Absolutely. it just seems like you'd want to share it with other people that are suffering. Definitely. I mean, sadly, so many Christians have taken literally what Jesus said to three disciples, see that you tell no one, you know? And, you know I mean, come on, you know, uh, he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. Mm. The same power that lives in us raised Jesus from the dead. So we're carriers right. of the presence the, of Jesus. The, the gift uh, or the burden that you have to share your faith, it's, 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 it's not a heavy burden. It's just something that it's a, it's a passion of yours to want yes. to share and to see people come to Christ. Absolutely. Some people think that evangelism is a gift that we're not all called to do that. You, do you refute that? Yes, I do. I, I think every single one of us is a witness. So for example, in a court of law, you'll have a witness and the witness gets up and says, look, this is my story. Let me tell you what I know, okay? Every Christian is a witness. Mm. Now, in a court of law, you also have the lawyer. The lawyer gets up and presents the facts in such a convincing manner as to get the jury to make a decision. Mm. Now, everyone's a witness, I'm a witness, but I'm also a lawyer. So I'm one of these people who is an evangelist, mm. who takes the facts of Christianity, presents them in such a convincing manner as to get the jury to make a decision. Yeah, I've always felt like if you're saved, if you are saved, you should be able to tell someone how you got saved. I think so. But yet so many people struggle uh, in their faith. I've actually written a book called Compelled, Yes. where when you really look at what Christ did on the cross you, and you understand the love of God yep. and the love that Jesus had when he laid down his life for you, that you're compelled, you can't help but tell other people. No, absolutely. And yet so many people struggle with it. Why do you think they struggle? Um, I think they struggle, uh, by the way, your book's really good. I've read it. Uh, very inspiring, and if you've not read it, I would encourage you to read it. And um, I, I think many people struggle because uh, I, I think they've got false um, attitudes about how it should be done. And I think the key is to be natural about it. Mm. Um, I think we should all be more intentional in reaching out to people um, by praying by caring and by sharing and we can all pray for Every, our neighbors everybody can pray everyone can pray for their family friends neighbors and colleagues you don't even have to talk to anybody at that stage absolutely. you're just talking to god the father absolutely and when you and when you pray for well, someone we're going to go to point to the caring part yes. but when you pray for someone 
God, God begins to work in their heart. And God also works in your heart, right? When you pray, God, God begins to move you and, and move that person. And when we pray, coincidences happen. Mm. And I think that's very, very important. So my wife and I, we pray uh, for all the people we know who don't yet know Jesus. Mm. And we pray for them daily. And you believe what's going to happen by praying for them? Uh, what, what, what do you believe is going to happen? Well, we're praying uh, that their eyes will open. Mm. We're praying that the eyes of their hearts will open. Mm. Uh, we're praying for connections. We're praying for opportunities. We're praying to help them on their journey of faith. Mm. We're praying, you know, for all these things, expectant uh, that God will mm. hear our prayers. So we pray, then we... Well, you can't pray and not care. Mm. And praying leads to caring. Okay. And um, look, uh, our neighbors next door where we live, they're not Christians yet. Okay. Uh, but they call, our, they call my wife and I the neighbors from heaven. Really? Which is really lovely, isn't it? Are they talking to you or to your wife? Well, they're talking to my uh, wife. I knew, I knew, yeah, I knew. Yeah, you knew, you knew. <laughs> no, but we've got to care for the people around us. I mean, some churches, you know, might have a campaign, oh, go on a missions trip. And I say, yeah, I believe in all of that. I think that's wonderful. And I say, yes, go on a missions trip, walk next door. Amen. And I, I think sometimes we bypass Jerusalem, bypass Judea, mm -hmm. bypass Samaria, and go to the ends of the earth, yeah, and we the, ignore our neighbor. The person next neighbor. door is just as lost as the guy across the, across the other side of the globe. But. So how can we care? How can we show what's called incarnational evangelism? You know, tangibly, visibly, visually express the mm -hmm. faith mm -hmm. to others, caring. And then number three. Well, you pray, you care, and then you share. And that means you're sharing in conversation. Uh, what, I, what I like in John chapter 4, uh, we have this wonderful story of Jesus and a woman known as the Samaritan woman. Mm. Now, when Jesus met the Samaritan woman, what were the differences that existed between the two? The Samaritan woman is living in adultery and Jesus is the high priest. Mm. So you've got a moral barrier. She's a woman, Jesus is a man. Mm. You've got a social barrier. Mm. She's a Samaritan, he's Jewish. You've got a racial barrier. She's a Samaritan, he's Jewish. You've got a religious barrier. Mm. So we've got a moral barrier, social barrier, racial barrier, religious barrier. Mm. How does Jesus engage with her? Well, he speaks to her on what they've got in common. Right. They've only got one thing in common. Yes. H2O. Yes. Water. They need water. So Everybody needs water. Everyone need, so because that's the thing they've got in common, that's what Jesus engages with her about. Yes. And he talks about water, mm. and then he gets her attention. Mm. And what is really interesting, when you read the chapter, she addresses Jesus four times. And the first time she addresses him, she says, Jew. But the way she says it is kind of like, Jew. Mm. Second time she speaks to him, sir. Mm. Third time she speaks to him, prophet. Fourth time she speaks to him, Messiah. Wow. So in that little conversation, her whole attitude changed. And, and I think it's having, just look, have you needed something God provided? Well, you've got a story to tell. Were you anxious and then experienced peace? Well, you've got a story to tell. Mm. Uh, there's all sorts of stories that we can tell of how Jesus has helped us. And that is so insightful. And I wanna ask you, when you just uh, uh, out today, you know, you were at a hotel, you're gonna go to a restaurant later on this afternoon, you might meet someone on the streets or in church or at a mall. What's going through your mind when you see someone? How quick does that eternal destiny of that person, it triggers in you that you need to be concerned about that person? Or is it just automatic? Well, uh, as I said earlier, Dudley, look, uh, we carry the presence of Jesus. Mm -hmm. When I received Jesus, I received his Holy Spirit and his Holy Spirit lives in me. So wherever I go, I'm a carrier 
of the presence of Jesus. So I'm a, a representative mm. of Jesus. I'm his ambassador. So for me, wherever I go and whoever I'm interacting with, I'm endeavoring in some way to allow that aroma to touch them. It might be a word, it might be visual, it might be verbal, but I'm always open to the option. But you're, you're always looking for someone. I'm always looking for and, someone. And, uh, and how do you, that burden that you have, that passion, for someone, you know, I look at my church, I, I wish everybody had what you had. I wish everyone, because I, I think I have that too. Yes. Uh, how do you when, you, when you talk to the church, what do you say to them to get them to have that passion as well? Okay, look, a missionary is not someone who crosses the sea. A missionary is someone who sees the cross. Mm. When you've seen the cross of Jesus, when you've experienced what Jesus did on the cross, and you're empowered by the Holy Spirit. Right. In the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, the love of Christ compels me. And so I would encourage every believer uh, to pray that they would be so aware of the presence of Jesus that they would be empowered to be a channel of that grace mm. wherever they go. And I would give people realistic like uh, goals. So I would say to a church, look, come on, we can all pray for three people. Surely we can all pray for three people. Surely we can all reach out and care for at least three people. Surely we could all sow some seed into the lives of three people. Surely. And surely <laughs> we could invite people. I mean, so for example, look, at the end of the day, uh, it's not my responsibility whether someone comes to an event or not, mm. but it is my responsibility to invite them. Mm. Mm. And so if, for example, everybody in your church mm. a couple of times a year invites a plus one, right. let's see what happens. Uh, this is the Dudley Rutherford podcast. I'm talking to Jay John, and uh, he has a website called Canon, uh, C-A-N-O-N, Canon. J, just the letter J and the word John, Canon J. John, and it will be in the description of this podcast if you're interested in looking him up and following him. I want you to explain just briefly you, the work that you do in the UK. You're here in, in the studio here in California, but in the UK, you rent out soccer stadiums. We know Billy Graham kind of rents out stadiums when, when he was alive and he'd fill it up and people coming down on the field to except Christ, you do, this, you do this over in the UK. Is there anyone else doing this in the UK? I've never heard, I mean, I look at you, it seems like you've been doing these, these uh, conferences there in the, in the so their soccer stadiums, right? Yes. Tell us, tell us what you're doing over there. Well, okay, I do a number of things, okay? I'm a proclaimer of the message of Jesus and uh, we do them in small arenas, um, in smaller, um, uh, capacity venues, but also we have done them um, in soccer stadiums as well. And um, we had a recent one where we did it in Singapore, mm. and 227 churches partnered with us. Really? And we were in the national stadium. And um, it was so exciting because we had six events. We had a, um, a Chinese meeting with a Chinese evangelist. We had a Tamil meeting with a Tamil evangelist. We had a children's event uh, with children's workers. And then I did the three English speaking meetings. Wow. And 130,000 came to the wow. meetings. Wow. Um, and you call these plus one? Yeah, And plus what's the one. idea behind plus one? What's well, the idea behind look, that? Look, before you're, you're a, a follower of Jesus, um, you're in negative territory, okay? So when you become a believer, when you receive Christ, when you're born again, you then move into positive territory. And before you're a believer, you can go all the way back to minus 100. Mm. So this is what I always feel when I preach the gospel. If there's anyone who's minus 100, I hope by the end of the evening, they'll be minus 90. 
Mm. Those that are minus 60 will become minus 50. Those that are minus 30 will become minus 20. I'm tracking. And those that are minus 10, God willing, they'll all step over the line. Mm. So I, I think that what we do in preaching the gospel is to help people on their journey of faith. Amen. And it appears that people do need to hear the gospel several times. What do you think about the UK uh, when you're over there? Do you feel like it's a post-Christian country? Do you see that happening in the United States of America? Do you see God at work? Obviously, you're holding these crusades. You, where, yeah. where is the UK? Where's God? What do you see in, in the culture? In the Well, I look, in both the UK and in the US, I think we've seen fallow ground mm. and you can see that and you can sense it. Um, but you know how sometimes you look up at the sky and it's completely cloudy, yes. but you know that the sun is there. Yes. But then you find that the clouds begin to separate yes. and you can see the sun more clearly. Yes. I, I feel that both in the UK and in the US, the clouds are dispersing. Wow, I love that analogy. And I also feel sometimes when we say, oh, look at the chaos, look at the instability. I, I love that. Right. I love chaos. I love instability because chaos and instability always precede a spiritual awakening. Mm. I, w I wanna ask you uh, if you've ever thought about the Bible says that when one person comes to know the Lord, yeah. that there's more rejoicing in heaven, this party, this celebration. Yeah. What do you think is happening up there in heaven when one person steps forward and surrenders their life to Christ? What is that party like up there? Well, do you know, I have pondered that. And you it, have? It, oh, and it, it actually blows my <laughs> mind. Uh, that, that image, that, that thought, uh, like we Christians, we're waiting for the Lord to return. Yes. Okay, and um, in 2 Peter it says, like, well, well, where is he? Where is he? Where is he? Scoffers, the scoffers are scoffing. The, the scoffers are scoffing. Yeah. And, and the writer says he's delaying his coming so that more people mm. will respond, mm. more people will repent. Mm. And it's like the whole of heaven is almost like saying to Jesus, oh, Jesus, don't go back yet. Don't go back yet because there could be more, there could be more, there could be more. Ah, oh, there's another one. Yes. yes. But there will come a day Where he when Jesus back. will come back. You know, our church here in Southern California, Shepherd Church, it, it, we're having a revival this week, but it's really every weekend. Yeah. Uh, it's like people come just on Easter. We have Easter every weekend at yes. our church. It's just the yes. celebration. Uh, and I always, I always think, man, if, if I, I wish the whole world could see what happens in our church. But I, I agree with you. I think, uh, you know, why doesn't the Lord come back? I think there's all kinds of great churches and ministries, yeah. the crusades that you're holding over in the UK that God is saying, hey, there are still ways and means for people. Absolutely. And it says that he's a patient God, that a day is like a thousand years and a thousand yes. years is like a day. And uh, that the reason he hasn't come back is because there are still churches that are still preaching Jesus and there's still people. Absolutely. And as long as people have a chance, he keeps delaying because he wants that sure. one last person to, to come to know the Lord. There's, I, I wanna kind of wrap this up. There's a lot of churches that are not growing. There's a lot of pastors that are discouraged. Um, I, I have this feeling, and I've always felt this, you could, put me anywhere. You could put me on the top of a parking garage and I would figure out a way to start a church yeah. and next week we'd have four and then six, then eight. And I just, there's something in me that knows how to do that. I think I could put you in a movie theater. I could put you in a, a gas station and I said, hey, I want you to, you'd learn, you'd figure out how to reach people. But there's a lot of churches that are not growing. There's a lot of pastors discouraged. I want you to just, before we wrap this up, to, to, to have a word of encouragement to that pastor who feels like he's in a situation where his church is not growing. Maybe he's lost his focus. That passion that he, when he went to, when just out of Bible college, man, he was ready yeah. to charge hell with a squirt gun. And today he's just discouraged and almost feeling defeated. 
you have a word of encouragement to, to that guy to hang in there and to just go back to that calling and that burden that you had when you first signed up to, to be a pastor? Well, okay. Uh, the, this pastor came to see me and uh, said that the, the church wasn't growing and I listened and, and, um, and they wanted my uh, wisdom on it. And I said to this pastor, well, I feel in your situation, I feel you should shut the church down. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and the pastor started crying. <laughs> right? And um, do you know something, Dudley? That is a hard thing to say but some churches need to mm. shut down. Mm. Okay, but if you know you are in God's will in that particular church and God's work is not finished, mm. then I would encourage you to pray, mm. to fast, mm. uh, to seek holiness more and more and more um, and and to do what we're instructed to do in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, where in Acts um, 5, we've got the issue of the Greek-speaking widows who are being neglected in the distribution of food. So here's an issue regarding social responsibility, and it's brought to the Apostles. And the Apostles said, ah, this is very important, but it's not important for us. So they gave that responsibility to seven people full of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And they said, we will turn our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. Mm. Um, a friend of mine became a pastor in London um, recently. And he said, I said, Jay John, give me some advice. What, what should I do? I said, one hour a day, every day, I want you to walk around the area of your church, mm. greet people as you see them, and just prayer walk one hour a day, every day, and see what happens. Step one of the prayer, care, and share Absolutely. program. And um, Jay John, I want to thank you for coming thank uh, you. And, and hanging out with us here today. I really believe that you're one of those people that shine like the stars in the universe against this world and uh, the culture in which we live. There's a certain joy and a happiness that you bring that come, it does come from the Lord. I, I love the fact that you said after you became a Christian, you became even a funnier person. Yeah. Um, but I pray for nothing but God's blessing uh, to be upon you. And I want anyone who's listening to this if, to understand that it's not just a, a, a pastor or an evangelist who's been called to share your faith that if you have ever met Christ, if you know Christ, if he forgave you of your sins, if he redeemed you, if he restored you, if he put within you the hope of heaven, yeah. that when you just walk down the streets of your city or down the hallways of your school, every single person that your eyes come in contact with, you need to understand that person has a soul that's going to go on for all of eternity. And maybe God put you at that moment, at that time, to talk to that person, a divine appointment that God set up so that you might pray for that person, that you might care for that person, yeah. and that you'd find a way to share your life, your story, but to point that person to Jesus. And I, I want you to continue to pray for J. John and his Thank ministry you. in the UK. Again, his website is in the description of this podcast, Canon J. John. Look him up, pray for him. And uh, here in America and across the pond, I pray that every single believer in Jesus Christ will actively be sharing your faith, pointing people to Jesus, knowing that one day the Lord is gonna come back and at yeah. that time it's gonna be too late. Yeah. Now's the time, today's the day. Uh, make sure uh, that uh, you are in tune with God and mm. His Spirit, pray. And, and I pray that you will be compelled by the love of God. Again, it's Dudley Rutherford, Godly Goosebumps. Go to our website. If you've never been to the website, go to godlygoosebumps.com. Hit that subscribe button and tell others, share this story, and be back next week. We'll tell you another story that will give you godly goosebumps. God bless. Bye-bye.